Hello, welcome to another Read With Me session. I'm yours truly, Isabel Bedell, and I'm here to read with you chapter 4.2, Playing to Win, The Risk Growth Bucket. Risk slash growth bucket. By this book, Money, Master the Game by Tony Robbins. It's going to be a good one. So the first quote that comes in is, the winner ain't the one with the fastest car. It's the one who refuses to lose. That's Dale Earnhardt Sr. Wow, that's a good one. The risk growth bucket is where everybody wants to be. Why? Because it's sexy. It's exciting. You can get a much higher return in here. But the key word is can. You can also lose everything you've saved and invested. So whatever you put in your risk growth bucket, you have to be prepared to lose a portion or even all of it if you don't have to, if you don't have protective measures in place. How do we know this? Because in everything in life, including markets, run in cycles. There are going to be ups and downs and anybody who invests in one particular kind of asset while it's on roll, be it real estate, stocks, bonds, commodities, or whatever, and thinks that the party will last forever because this time will be different, should get ready for a rude awakening. When I interviewed Jack Bogle for this book, he repeated one of his mantras, markets always revert to the mean. That means what goes up, what is, going to come, what is going to come down and vice versa. That means what goes up is going to come down and vice versa. And I'm sure Ray Dalio got your attention when he said that whatever your favorite investment might be at some point in your life, you can count on it dropping 50 to 70% in value. While there's unlimited potential for upside in this bucket, never forget that you could lose it all or at least a significant portion. That's why I call this risk slash growth bucket and not the growth slash risk bucket because growth is not guaranteed, but risk is. Here's a sampling of seven main assets, asset classes to consider. Number one, equities. Another word for stocks or ownership shares of individual companies or vehicles for owning many of them at once, like mutual funds, indexes, and exchange-traded funds, ETFs. Exchange-traded funds, ETFs, have been called the it girl of the stock market, ballooning in popularity by, the, by more than 2,000% from 2001 to 2014 and holding more than two trillion, two trillion dollars in investments. But what exactly are they? ETFs are built like mutual funds or index funds because they contain a diversified collection of assets, but you can trade them just like individual stocks. Most of them follow a theme, which is small cap stocks, municipal bonds, or even gold, and or trace an index. But with an index or a mutual fund, you have to wait until the end of the trading day to buy or sell. ETFs can be traded all day long. Experts say that if you like the idea of an index fund, but you want to buy when you want to buy, when you see the price is low and sell the price is high during trading session, an ETF might be for you. But that's trading, not investing. And trying to, trying to time a market brings very intense and special risks. There's another difference when you buy shares of an ETF. You are not buying the actual stocks, bonds, commodities, or whatever else is bundled in the fund. You're buying shares in an investment fund that owns those assets. The company promises that you'll receive the same financial outcome as if you'd owed, owned them yourself. But don't worry, it sounds more complicated than this. A lot of people like ETFs because they give you a tremendous amount of diversity, diversity 
at a low cost. In fact, many ETFs have lower fees than even comparable traditional index funds and sometimes lower minimum investment requirements because they don't engage in a lot of the kind of trading that produces capital gains, they can be tax efficient. Although there is a move toward more actively managed ETFs coming to the market, which makes them less, less tax efficient. Should you invest in ETFs? Well, Jack Bogle, founder of Vanguard, which accidentally offers many ETF funds, told me he sees nothing wrong with owning broad spectrum index ETFs. But he warns that some are too specialized for individual investors. You cannot, you cannot only bet on the market, he told me, but on countries, on industry sectors, and you might be right, and you may be right, and you may be wrong. David Swenson wonders why individual investors should bother with, with ETFs at all. I'm a big believer in buying and holding for the long run, he told me. The main reason you'd go into an ETF is to trade, and so I'm not a big fan. Here's another one, high yield bonds. You might also know these as junk bonds, and there's a reason they call them junk. There are bonds with the lowest safety ratings, and you get a high yield coupon, which is a rate, higher rate of return than a more secure bond, only because you're taking a big risk. For a refresher, go back and read the bond briefing at the end of the last chapter. Number three, real estate. We all know real estate can have tremendous returns. You probably know a lot about this category, but there are many ways to invest in the property. You can invest in a home that you rent out for income. You can buy property, fix it up, and then flip it in the short term. You can invest in first trust deeds. You can buy commercial real estate or an apartment. One of my favorites that I mentioned to you early on in this book is investing in senior housing, where you can get both the income and the potential growth and appreciation as well or you can buy REITs, which are real estate investment trusts. These are trusts that own big chunks, big chunks of commercial real estate and sell shares to small investors like mutual funds. REITs trade like stocks and you can buy shares of a REIT index fund, which gives you a diversity of many different REITs. For growth, the Nobel economist Robert Schiller told me that you're better off investing in REITs than owning your own home, which belongs in the security bucket anyways. Buying an apartment REIT sounds to me like, a, maybe, like maybe a better investment than buying your own house, he said, because there seems to be a tilt toward renting now. That could change, of course. And as with any investment, you've got to pause and think, what am I betting on? You're betting on the price of the property to go up over time, but there's no guarantee. So that's why it's in the risk slash growth bucket. If it goes up, it could have a nice rate of return. If it doesn't, you get nothing or you lose it all. When you buy your own home, you're betting that the price of your home will go up. When you're buying real estate that has income associated with it, aka like a rental unit or apartment building, or commercial real estate, or a REIT, or even an index that holds all of this, Schiller points out that you have two ways to win. You can make income along the way, and if the property increases in value, you can also have the opportunity to make money when you sell on the appreciation. Number four is commodities. This category includes gold, silver, oil, coffee, cotton, and so on. Over the years, gold has been considered the ultimate safe haven for many people, a staple of their security bucket, and conventional wisdom says it would only go up in value during uncertain times. Then its price dropped more than 25% in 2013. Why would you invest in gold? You could keep a small amount in your portfolio that says in case paper money 
disappears, then this is a little portion of my security. And you know, if all hell breaks loose and the government collapses under a zombie invasion, at least you've got some gold or silver coins to buy yourself a houseboat and head to sea. On second thought, can zombies swim? Otherwise, gold probably belongs in the risk slash growth bucket. You'd invest in it as a protection against inflation or as part of a balanced portfolio, as we will learn later on, but you have to accept the risk. So don't kid yourself if you buy gold, you're betting it will go up in price. Unlike many other investments, there's no income from this investment like you might get in stocks, from dividends, or from income-producing real estate or bonds. So gold could be a risk, a good risk or a bad one, but it goes in your risk slash growth bucket for sure. This is not a, an attack on gold. In fact, in the right economic season, gold is a superstar performer. That's why in chapter 5.1, we will talk about all of the seasons of strategy. You'll see why it's such an invaluable part to actually have in a small portion of your portfolio. Here's number five, currencies. Got a yen? to buy some yen. Since all currency is just paper, currency investing is a pure speculation. There are people who make a fortune in it and even more who lose a fortune. Currency trading is not for the faint of heart. Collectibles, art, wine, coins, automobiles, and antiques are just a few. Once again, these assets, Asset classes requires very special knowledge or a lot of time on eBay. Number seven, here is structured notes. What are these doing in both buckets? Because there are different types of structured notes. Some have 100% principal protection and those can go into your security blanket as long as the issuing bank is financially solid. Then there are other kinds of notes that give you higher potential returns, but only partial protection if the index drops. So say that you buy a note with 25 protection. That means that if the stock market drops to 25%, you don't lose a dime. If it goes down 35%, you lose 10%. But for taking more risk, you get more upside, sometimes as much as 150% of the index to which it is tied. In other words, if the market went up 10%, you'd receive 15% return. So there's potential for greater gains, but there's definitely increased risk. Remember, once again, structured notes should be processed or purchased through an I RIA, which is a registered insurance advisor who will work to strip out all excess fees and deliver them to you in the form of an even greater return. Safety doesn't happen by accident is a quote that was taken from the Florida highway signs. Safety doesn't happen by accident. We've now covered a sample of some of the investment vehicle assets, vehicle slash assets that you might find in a diversified risk slash growth bucket. You may be wondering why I haven't included some of the most daring investment vehicles of our time, which is call and put options, credit default obligations, and a whole host of exotic financial instruments available to traders these days. If you build up a lot of wealth, you may want to have your fiduciary look into some of these vehicles, but just realize that if you're playing this game, you're most likely no longer just an investor, you've become a speculator as well. It's what's called a momentum trading. And you have to realize that you can lose everything and more if you play the wrong game. And because the mantra of this book is that the road to financial freedom is through saving and investing for compounded growth, I'll leave a discussion of these momentum assets for another day. It's time to get in the game. Okay, now you know that the players that belong in your asset in your allocation buckets, and you know that the key to building a winning team is diversify, diversify, diversify. 
but there's more. You not only have to diversify between your security and your risk slash growth buckets, but within them as well. As Bert and Mulkeel shared with me, you should diversify across securities, across asset classes, across markets, and across time. That's how you truly get a portfolio for all seasons. So for example, he says, if you want to invest not only in both stocks and bonds, but also in different types of stocks and bonds, many of them from different markets in different parts of the world, we'll actually talk about how diversifying across time is everything. And most experts agree that the ultimate diversification tool for individual investors is a low fee index fund, which gives you the broadest exposure to the largest numbers of securities for the lowest cost. The best way to diversify is to own the index, but you don't have to pay all these fees. David Swenson told me that, and you actually get tax efficiency, meaning that if you're investing outside of your IRA or 401k type of account, you don't get taxed for all that constant buying and selling that goes on in most mutual funds. Here's a section called have some fun. Of course, if you have your money machine full gear and you have, you have the, the desire, there's nothing wrong with setting aside a tiny percent of your risk slash growth bucket to pick some stocks and do some day trading. Index your important money, then go have fun. Bern Malkiel told me it's better to it's better than going to the racetrack. But he also said, limit yourself to five percent or less of your total assets of assets or portfolio. That's a very important part. If you're going to be day trading, do so with only 5% of your portfolio, nothing exceeding that. Is all of this giving you an idea of what kind of portfolio mix would be best for you? Before you decide, just remember that we all have a tendency to pile up on the investments that we think will give us our greatest victories and everybody gets victories. You know why? Different environments reward different investments. So let's be, let's say real estate is hot. You're invested in real estate. So now you're a genius. Stock market is hot. If you have stocks, you're a genius. Bonds are great. And if you have bonds, once again, you're an investment master. Or maybe you just hand landed in the right place at the right time, right? So you don't want to be get overconfident. That's why as allocation is so important. What do all the smartest people in the world say? I'm going to be wrong. So they design their asset allocation, ideally, to make money in the long term, even if they're wrong in the short term. What do all the smart people in the world say? I'm going to be wrong. So they design their asset allocation, ideally, to make money in the long term, even if they're wrong in the short term. Strong. So let's test your knowledge. In the coming pages, I'll be showing you the portfolios or asset allocations designed by some of the greatest investors of all time. Let's start with a sample from someone you've been hearing from throughout this book, David Swenson, Yale's 23.9 billion plus man, a true master of asset allocation. Would you be interested in seeing his personal portfolio recommendations? Me too. So when we sat down together at his office at Yale, I asked him the key question. If you couldn't leave any money to your kids, only a portfolio and a set of investment principles, what would they be? He showed me the asset allocation that he recommends for individual investors, one he thinks will hold up against the test of time. He also recommends his portfolio for all the institutions other than Yale, Stanford, Harvard, and Princeton. Why? Because these four institutions employ an army of full-time top analysis, analysts. When I saw his list, I was amazed by how elegant and simple it was. I've shown you 15 types of assets to choose from. He, only, he uses only six categories, all in index funds. 
I was also surprised by how much weight he gave to one particular bucket. Can you guess which one? Let's activate some of what we've learned thus far from the division. Uh, far about the division between the security slash risk growth bus buckets. Have a look at the box below and jot down where each asset class belongs. Check which ones you think belong in the security bucket where you put things that are going to give you the most modest returns in exchange for a lower risk. And then check which belong in the risk slash growth bucket where there's greater upside potential, but also greater downside. And then this is David Swenson's portfolio. And this is why you should get the physical book. It's literally breaking down the investment portfolio. And domestic stock, international stock, emerging emerging stock markets, REITs, long-term U.S. treasuries, and TIPS. So let's start with the top four. The first is a broad domestic stock index, something like Vanguard's 500 index or the Wilshire 5000 total market index. Where would you put it? Does it come with risk? Absolutely. Have you got <clears throat> have you got a guaranteed return? Absolutely not. Could you lose it all? Unlikely, but it could drop significantly and it has at times. Over the long term, US stocks certainly have a great track record. Remember how they compare to owning your own personal real estate? Equities have done well over time, but they are one of the most volatile assets classes in the short term. In the last 86 years through 2013, the S&P 500, the S&P lost money 24 times in 86 years. So stock index funds belong in which buckets? They belong in the risk slash growth bucket index funds. How about international stocks? David Swenson puts a lot of weight in foreign stocks because of the diversity, diversity that they bring into the portfolio. If there's a slump in America, business may be booming in Europe or Asia, but not everybody agrees with, with David. Foreign currencies aren't as stable as good old US greenbacks. So there's a currency risk in investing in foreign stocks. And Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard with 64 years of success says that owning American companies is global. To Tony, the reality is that among the big corporations in America, none are domestic, he told me. They're all over the world, McDonald's, IBM, Microsoft, General Motors. So you own an international portfolio anyways. Where do foreign stocks belong? I think we can agree that they are also in the risk growth bucket. I love, I love that. Owning American companies is global. McDonald's, IBM, Microsoft, General Motors, they're all international. You know? How about emerging markets? David Swenson likes to put some money into the volatile stocks of developing nations like Brazil, Vietnam, South Africa, and Indonesia. You can get specular, spectacular returns, but you can also lose everything, which is also in the risk slash growth bucket. How about REITs? David told me he likes real estate investment trusts that own big central business district office buildings and big regional malls and industrial buildings. They generally throw off a high income component. So these index funds can generate great returns, but they rise and fall with the American commercial real estate market. So which bucket? It would go into the risk slash growth bucket. What about the last two on the list? Long-term US treasuries and tips. 
do they offer lower returns in exchange for more safety? Spot on. So which bucket do they belong in? Security. TIPS and US Treasuries are in security. So here you go, congratulations. You've just assigned six major assets, asset classes to their proper allocation buckets, which is something that the 99.9% .9 of people you pass on the street wouldn't be able to do. That's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? But let's dig a little deeper here to understand why David chose this mix and why it may be not right for you. Okay, in the next video, we're gonna actually understand the deeper understanding of why David, David Swenson chose these specific, um, these specific asset allocations and why it is. So that's pretty cool, but we learned a lot in this chapter and I'll see you in the next one.